So I wanted to throw out there before I forget, a couple of people had mentioned in prayer requests the idea of this being a time to be able to, to share our faith. There is so much talk about Christmas. Um, yeah, what a, what a great opportunity. And the people who studied these things have found that a large majority of Americans would go to church if someone invited them. Uh, and so Christmas is a great time to invite people because everybody loves Christmas or many people love Christmas. If my sister-in-law watches this, she would disagree with the statement. Everybody loves Christmas, but um, it's a good time to come. Uh, and there's usually good crowds, so you can be a little anonymous if you're not comfortable you know, being in church. Uh, but this is a wonderful time to invite somebody to join you for church. So I just want to make sure I throw that out there for you. A uh, couple of brief housekeeping things. We will be wrapping up the Book of Numbers tonight. Um, if that requires that we kick into high gear and really blitz through, we will do that. But we will be done with the Book of Numbers because there is no class next week in the run-up to Christmas. We will get back together on Wednesday, January 4th. I am not entirely sure what we're going to do on Wednesday the 4th, um, but we will do something. Uh, and then we will not have class on the 11th. I will be at the uh, pastoral leadership program. So then we'll get back being here every week in a row on the 18th. So um, this is the last I will see of folks uh, on Zoom uh, until the new year. And uh, so there. And then when we come back on the 18th, then we will start our um, our series on Satan. So, uh, anything still outstanding from last time? Anything we went over uh, that you want to spend a little more time with or anything you want to kind of catch up on? And if not, that's okay. So, we finished up the first section we were talking about remember we have three primary settings in the book of numbers we have the foot of mount sinai we have the wilderness kind of to the south and the east of the promised land and now at the end we have the area immediately to the east of the jordan river so as the people are all gathering and preparing to cross into the promised land that is our setting for what we've been working with last week and tonight. And we, in on the whole, have three types of material. We have narrative material that moves the story along. We have legal or teaching material that helps shape the people as God's people who will live in the land. And then we have poetic material, which as we've said before, is typically the oldest material chronologically to make it into these biblical sources. So we wrapped up the narrative stuff last week. We had some incidents of the Israelites worshiping another god. We had Moses appointing Joshua as his successor and pouring out the spirit on him. And then we had some specific instructions and consequences for people moving into the promised land. So the next thing we're going to turn to, and we will do, on the whole, we will do some summaries of this legal or teaching material here. A lot of it is very similar to stuff we looked at in Leviticus. Uh, but again, just to give you an idea of the sort of things you find in the book of Numbers, uh, in chapters 28 and 29, there is a whole list of offerings that are appointed to be made daily, weekly, monthly, and then at the various festivals, the festival of Passover, the festival of Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, or as it is called in Greek, Pentecost, the festival of trumpets, uh, which I am completely unfamiliar with, the Day of Atonement, and Sukkot, which is the festival of booths. So we get some detailed things about what types of offerings are supposed to be made. In chapter 30, there is a whole ch chapter about the vows and the oaths that can be made by women. And for the most part, if 
their husband or father says, no, I don't really think she should have made that oath, they can uh, overrule that oath on for her. Um, so there. So we have some uh, content there. And then we get into chapter 34. We have an outline of the boundary of the promised land. And interestingly enough, compared to some of the other places in scripture where they describe this as the boundary of the promised land, this description is noticeably smaller than some of the other ones. Some of the other descriptions talk about the promised land being everything from the Nile to the Euphrates, or everything from the middle of Egypt to the middle of Iraq. And this uh, outlines it as being more similar to what actually was the promised land uh, when the people took possession of it. But then we do get uh, one part that I do actually want to read through rather than summarize here. Uh, Carol, would you share with us, please, Numbers chapter 35, verses 1 through 8. In the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the Israelites to give from the inheritance they possess towns the Levites to live in, towns for the Levites to live in. You shall also give to the Levites pasture land surrounding the towns. The town shall be theirs to live in, and their pasture land shall be for their cattle, for their livestock, and for all their animals. The pasture lands of the towns which you shall give to the Levites shall reach from the wall of the town outward a thousand cubits all around. You shall measure outside the town for the east side 2,000 cubits, for the south side 2,000 cubits, for the west side 2,000 cubits, and the north side 2,000 cubits, with the town in the middle. This shall belong to them as pasture for the land for their towns. The towns that you give to the Levites shall include the six cities of refuge, where you shall permit a slayer to flee, and in addition to them, you shall give them 42 towns. The towns that you give to the Levites shall total 48 with their pasture lands. As for the towns that you shall give from the possessions of the Israelites, from larger tribes you shall take many, and from the smaller tribes you shall take few, each in proportion to the inheritance that it obtains shall give it to the towns, to the Levites. So 11 of the 12 tribes get a territory. I mean, we could think of them, you know, each of them gets their own state, so to speak, except for which tribe? Which tribe does not get a contiguous block of land? The Levi. Right. So the Levites do not get a, a block of land. They get 48 cities when as part of each town that is kind of given to them, they have what seems like probably, excuse me, quite a bit of pasture land. So they have some land on which they can, they can farm uh, or practice animal husbandry. So they, they do have some places they can go, but why, why would they not just get a, you know, one spot on the map where they could all live together like the rest of the tribes. Why Why are the Levites treated differently? Because they're the, um, they're the uh, uh, priests or ministers, if you will, to the, to the other tribes. The, yeah, the, um, the priests. Right, so they, they lead worship. So what is the advantage of having them spread all over the country? They can lead worship for all then. If they were in a separate community, then they would be just in their own little circle. So they had to be spread out to teach and to right. lead worship. Right. So people have access to the people who can answer questions for them, the people who can uh, help them live faithfully. So yeah, they're spread out. So people do not all have to go to one place. Now, it's interesting when we get into the book of Deuteronomy, 
I'm not quite sure when that'll happen, but it will. When we get into Deuteronomy, the phrase that we start to hear that book use often is, you will do all these acts of worship at the place God will show you, uh, which is understood to be Jerusalem. So right now we have this idea of the people who lead worship are spread out all over the place. And by the time we get to Deuteronomy, there seems to be more of a trend to try and centralize at least the acts of worship that involved sacrifice. People obviously would gather on the Sabbath to pray. People would have ritual baths, that sort of thing, where they lived. But in terms of making a sacrifice to God, that was only supposed to take place in one place. So yeah, the Levites are spread out so that people can worship wherever they live. It also makes mention here of the six cities of refuge. And I just want to mention that is a place someone can go if they are accused of murder. They can go to this town of refuge and they can be there while the case is being arbitrated or tried. It's not the sort of thing. It's not like hopping on a plane to Brazil. If you get there, you just stay and you're you're fine for all time. No, this is to try and put things more in the hands of a judicial process rather than, well, we think this guy did this thing, so we're going to go get him. So the cities of refuge are kind of a, a temporary refuge while people sort things out. I came across that and, and thought that was kind of interesting. So wanted to pass it on to you. So a lot of the legal and teaching material has to do with types of sacrifices, with rules that are set up for how men and women will conduct themselves, as well as how people are going to be distributed in the land, uh, both the 11 tribes that get their own territory, as well as the Levites who are gonna be spread all over the place. So that is, that is the type of legal and teaching material that happens towards the end of the book of Numbers as they are getting ready to cross into the promised land. These are things that they will need to know sooner rather than later. Questions, insights, comments? And if not, that's okay. We do have a, a good clustering of poetic material in this portion of the book of Numbers. We're going to spend a little time with that because, again, that may give us an insight into parts of tradition that were really important to people and were handed down um, from a very ancient source. So let's go ahead. Uh, Renee, I'm going to ask you to unmute and make sure you're good and close to your microphone and share with us, please, a couple of different verses out of chapter 21, uh, verses 14 and 15, verses 17 and 18, and then 26 through 30. I'm sorry, and then 27 through 30, not 26 through 30. All right, we'll start with 14 and 15. That is why the book of the word of the Lord says, they have in Suppa and the Ravine, the Arnon and the Ravine, into the settlement to lie along the border of Moab. Then but if you jump down a verse or two there. Sing a song. Bring up old wells. Sing about it. About the well that the princes dug, that the nobles of the people sank, the nobles with scepters and staffs. Then they went from the wilderness of Matana. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. And then the longer portion there, uh, 27 through 30. That is why the poets say, come to the Heshbon and let it be rebuilt, let Sihon city be restored. Fire went out from Heshbon, ablaze from the city of Sihon. It consumed Ar of Moab, the citizens of Arnon's heights. Woe to you, Moab, you are destroyed, people of Chemosh. He has given up his sons as fugitives and his daughters as captives to Sihon, king of the Amorites. But we have overthrown them. Heshbon's dominion has been destroyed. 
all the way to the bottom. It demolished them as far as the south, which extends to Madiba. So you have here some excerpts from this, this book that, to my knowledge, we do not have a copy of, the Book of the Wars of the Lord. The first section seems to be they're talking about the territory of the Amorites. Then they're talking about when water was, uh, Moses said, gather the people together, I will give them water. So there's this miraculous occurrence. And then the third one, the longest one, is is kind of an old war song. It is singing of, of the glories of the people's conquests. Fire came from Heshbon, fire from the city of Sihon. It devoured Ar. Um, you know, they perished from Heshbon to Debon. We laid waste until fire spread to Medeba. So it's, it's a poem about uh, their glorious conquest in war. And of course, as a, a classicist, uh, it makes me think of the Iliad, uh, which is a extremely long poem about uh, about a war and all of the things that went on in that. But apparently, people in this part of the world, uh, in in this era, liked to write poems about wars. So you can see that they are recalling the, and it's the sort of thing where this maybe is the sort of song or poem you would teach the next generation. This is how we remember what our people have done, or maybe more accurately, this is how we try to help people remember what God has done. So we have some poetic content clustered here, and then we're gonna return to uh, what we talked about last week. We have I have a lock. question first. Can we yes. back up a minute? Were those um, poems songs? Like, can we assume that all these poems are songs and that's how they're passed on or are they spoken poetry? Mm, it's hard. I do not know. Um, when Hebrew scripture is read, it is usually cantillated. So it's not quite sung like you would sing a hymn, but it is intoned. And so I don't know how, you know, if that has always been the case or if that has been a relatively recent development. So I, I'm not sure if these particular things, they are, if I'm remembering right, it's poetry both by the way it is constructed. So they'll make these parallel things. You notice in the Psalms a lot, they kind of say the same thing twice, but slightly differently. So that's a poetic device in Hebrew, but I believe some of it is also by the meter, uh, how many syllables there are per line and so on. And that would, in my mind, make it much more likely to be, you could set it to music, but you don't necessarily have to. So I do not know. I could really easily see it going either way. Having it to a melody or a tune would certainly help make it easy to remember. But sometimes if something just has a, a, a well-written cadence or rhythm, you can kind of remember it based on that. Um, but I'm not sure whether it would be sung or whether it would be spoken. Um, So the bottom line is, I don't know. Uh, ne next time we uh, next time we have our our ask the rabbi segment, we'll uh, we'll have to see if we can get any insight on that. But regardless of whether it was spoken or sung, we are going to go back to the story of King Balak, who wanted to curse the Israelites, so he hired Balaam, and Balaam was on his merry way. God appeared and said, don't do it. Or no, he was not on his merry way because God said, don't do it. And the messenger said, no, we really want you to come. And God said, okay, you go along, but you do what I tell you. And then the angel appeared and made the donkey stop. The donkey started talking to him. And he finally shows up and he's talking to King Balak. And King Balak says, okay, you're supposed to be this wonderful diviner or seer. Uh, let's hear it. I want you to curse these people before they come through and tear up my territory. 
And so we get these poetic utterances, and it is not unusual that oracles uh, in ancient times were delivered in uh, poetry or song or meter of some sort. And of course, sometimes the, I don't think we see this as much in the Bible, but there's also a tradition in Greek mythology that a lot of the oracles came out and they were completely puzzling. Like they would get the utterance and then the people would have to figure out what it meant. A lot of these are much more clear and often if they are not clear, God follows up with an explanation. So I say good for the good, good for the Hebrew authors. Tom, would you share with us the first oracle that is in chapter 23 verses 7 through 10? Now remember, these are the words being spoken by the guy who was hired to curse the Israelites. <clears throat> then Balaam uttered his oracle saying, Balak has brought me from Aram, the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come, curse Jacob for me. Come, denounce Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the crags I see him, from the hills I behold him. Here is a people living alone and not reckoning itself among the nations. Who cannot count the dust of Jacob or number the dust cloud of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. So we have this likely very ancient words from Balaam. He says, yes, they have, he brought me here to curse them, but how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? Look how great this nation is. Let me die the death of the upright. Let my end be like his. So he wants to die, uh, maybe we would say, with a clean conscience. He wants to die knowing he has done the right thing, which is not cursing these people. I have a Jane, question. We, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I guess I want to be clear on what an oracle actually was considered. That is a fantastic question. An oracle is a prophetic utterance that is seemingly or, or that is communicated from the divine. So an oracle is very similar to a prophecy. It is a message from, from a divinity that is channeled through a, a speaker. So oracle and prophecy, I think, are, are very similar. So when we have these oracles from Balaam, you could say prophecy, but they're, they're messages from God that are coming through a particular individual. Is that, is that sitting right with everybody? Yes, thank you. Okay, very good. And the, the Greek the Greeks had oracles too, right? The oracle of Delphi and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yep, and and the uh, the Pythonus was the name of the person who gave the oracles at Delphi. It was always a woman, and they always came out as seemingly nonsensical gibberish. And there's lots of stories of people trying to figure out what exactly the oracle was supposed to mean. So yes, the oracle at Delphi, there were others, but that is certainly the, the big one where Apollo was supposed to be revealing things to people. Yes. So Jane, would you share with us the second oracle there, which is uh, chapter three, verses 18 through 24. Then Balaam uttered his oracle, saying, Rise, Balak, and hear, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a human being that he should lie, or a mortal that he should change his mind. 
Has he promised and will he not do it? Has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? See, I received a command to bless. He has blessed and I cannot revoke it. He has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord their God is with them, acclaimed as king among them. God who brings them out of Egypt is like the horns of a wild ox for them. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, no divination against Israel. Now it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, see what God has done. Look, a people rising out of a lioness and rousing itself like a lion, it does not lie down until it's eaten it until it has eaten the prey and drunk the blood of the slain. So we here have Balaam praising the God of Jacob. You know, this God is with them. He is acclaimed as king among them. He has brought them out of Egypt. Surely there is no enchantment against them. Uh, so he's saying right there, yeah, we, we can't curse these people. There is no divine power apart from their God, and their God has blessed them. This, this is just not working. See, or look, a people rising up like a lioness, rousing itself like a lion. That's what we talked about a moment ago, where very often the poetry in Hebrew will say the same thing twice in a row. It has those, it loves those couplets there. Nick, would you share with us, please, the third oracle? That is chapter 24, verses 3 through 9. And he uttered his oracle, saying, The oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, oracle of the man who tries prayer, the oracle of one who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down, but with eyes uncovered. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your encampment, encampments, O Israel, like palm groves that stretch far away, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall have abundant water. His king shall be higher than Agag, and the kingdom shall be exalted. God who brings him out of Egypt is like the horns of the wild ox for him. Oh, one more verse. Yes. All right, turn the pages. And he shall devour the nation that are his force and break their bones. He shall strike with his arrows. He crouched and he lay down like a lion and like a lioness who will rouse, he, rouse him up. Blessed is he, blessed is everyone who blesses you and cursed is everyone who curses you. So each oracle gets a little bit longer and it gets a little more effusive in its praise of, of God's people. And we finally get, you know, they're, they're like palm groves that stretch far away, like gardens by a river. Um, water will flow in buckets. Um, and then finally, we get there what we looked at last time in, in verse 10. Then Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam and he struck his hands together. I summoned you to curse my enemies, but instead you have blessed them these three times. So we just get more effusive in the praise. And then uh, we get to the fourth oracle. So after Balaam has been thrown out, he, he has these parting words that he's going to share with them, which I can share with you here. So this is out of chapter 24, verses 15. I've got another 15. question. Yes. 
I've got a question about the last oracle. This mm -hmm. um, that he says, blessed is everyone who blesses you and curses everyone who curses you. I hear mm -hmm. that used today, that that's still like, that's a promise from God. Is that still active today? Does that mean for us too? Well, it is, it is actually an echo of the promise made to Abraham. Uh, blessed are those who bless you and cursed are those who curse you. Um, or wait, no, with Abraham, it might have been, I will bless those whom you bless and I will curse those whom you curse. So it's similar, but I think it is slightly different. Um, I see no reason why it would not be still still a valid promise. Uh, it's, it's not given as a conditional type of thing. Uh, so I would see no reason why not. Thank you. You're welcome. So the, the fourth oracle here. So he uttered his oracle saying, the oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is clear the oracle of one who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down, but with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the borderlands of Moab and the territory of the Shithites. Edom will become a possession, seer a possession of its enemies, while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob, one out of Jacob shall rule and destroy the survivors of Ir. Then he looked on Amalek and uttered his oracle, saying, First among the nations was Amalek, but its end is to perish forever. Then he looked on the Kenite and uttered this oracle, saying, Enduring is your dwelling place, and your nest is set in the rock. Yet Cain is destined for burning. How long shall Ashur take you away captive? Again he uttered his oracle, saying, Alas, who shall live when God does this? But ships shall come from Kittim and shall afflict Ashur and Eber, and he shall also perish forever. Then Balaam got up and went away to his place, and Balak also went on his way. So we have a, a variety of oracles here. So he's gone from blessing the Israelites to cursing uh, the enemies of the Israelites. And again, we get it in these poetic terms. Um, and, and there it is. So that is some of our, our poetic material here out of the, the final portion of the book of numbers. Other questions? This, this last one was certainly a, a, a prophecy because it basically foretold, I think of what was going to happen to the peoples who occupied the, um, the promised land, right? That they would be mm -hmm. put asunder. Yep. So yeah, again, that difference between oracle and prophecy, um, it may just be uh, pe people who are professional Bible scholars may, may be able to draw a, a distinction, but for me, I think they're, they're overlapping at least. Any other questions or, or insights on our poetic material? Well, I want to turn. To me that, oh, it seems sad to me that they would take the time to make this into poetry. <laughs> Is that like a, I mean, why would they? It may have something to do with, uh, if it is a message from God, it may be spoken in a particular style of language. I think it, the reason why it is poetry in here, my, my best guess is that because it is poetic, because it was either... Uh, 
rhythmic or figurative in a way that made it easy to remember that it was passed down in this form. And so when they were um, putting, when they were writing the story down, remember the story has been told for generations and it's been told probably with a very high degree of fidelity. Um, these, these were people who respected that oral tradition because a lot of them did not have access to writing. Um, when your only way to pass information down, it, you know, even very important information is is oral tradition, your brain is a lot better at remembering things accurately, um, usually than, than ours are because we have writing and we use it. But my guess is the reason why this is poetic in form is because this is the way it was received um, because it is easier to pass along that story uh, as poetry. That is That is my best guess. So that's probably the the style that it was originally said, not something that came up later. It make it easily remembered. Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing that it did. It it did. This was spoken, you know, kind of more in this poetic style, um, and whether that has to do with how God revealed the message to Balaam or if that was just his style as, as a, a seer or a, a diviner, that I don't know. But my guess is this is probably more similar to the, the words that actually came out of his mouth. It was probably spoken like this originally, but for reasons I, I certainly don't know. Um, Cause in other, in other places, you know, God appears to Abraham and God says, Abraham, get up and leave your home and go to the place I show you. You know, there's, there's nothing poetic about that. God just speaks to him, you know, like we're speaking right now. Um, however, in the prophetic books, and you can see just based on the way they space out the lines in your Bible, if you turn to your pro prophetic books, it it's all, you know, Psalms and the prophets. So much of that is in kind of poetic form. Uh, and um, I'm not, I cannot say with certainty the significance of that. So when did the writing come about? Dave, King David's time maybe? Access to people, access to write on parchment or whatever? Yeah. Uh, Initial psalms are written on stones or something like that with, with symbols. So writing might have come about King gave King David's time. So this probably was written in exile, but right. Four hundred um, years after David. Yeah, by the time of of David, writing had been in existence for a while. Um, you know, the, the most ancient writing. I mean, obviously, the Egyptians had hieroglyphics, uh, and they were putting hieroglyphics on stuff that was being done well before the Exodus. Um, and some of the earliest writing that, that people have discovered, I mean, it is thousands and thousands of years ago. And if I remember right, when we talked about this in one of my classics classes, some of the earliest writing they have found, they're clay tablets. And it seems to be uh, like someone taking inventory. Like it's a list of this is how much stuff we have in this place. Like, you know, they wanted to know how much food they had. How long can we stay here? And they thought that was worth writing down. So writing had been around for a long time. Um, but the number of people who could actually use writing, the number of people who could read and write was really, really tiny. Um, and of course, I'm not sure how much even people who were literate, say, in the time of the Exodus, I'm not sure because, you know, they couldn't just open up a pack of paper and bust out a pen. You know, preparing something to be written down was pretty labor intensive. So I'm not sure exactly how much opportunity they would have had to do that in 
the conditions of the Exodus. By the time you get to David and you're living in a city and there's some affluence built up, you can train people as scribes. Yeah, that, that becomes significantly easier. But yeah, write, writing was certainly around at the time of the Exodus, but um, how much access people had to it, I'm guessing is probably pretty small. Any other questions or thoughts on the kind of the poetic content before we turn to uh, kind of the New Testament reception? All right, let us turn to New Testament reception. Uh, Carol, let me have you. Uh, look up the citation numbers, chapter 11, uh, those couple of verses there, 16 and 17, and then 26 through 30. Uh, Renee, let me have you look up those uh, two citations from Luke out of chapter 10 and chapter 9, and I have them in that order for a reason, you will see. Uh, and let's make that chapter 9, 49 and 50. We'll, we'll double you up there. And... Tom, let me have you look up that reference out of the book of Acts chapter 2. So let's take a look and see uh, what we get out of numbers and then what the New Testament authors, how the New Testament authors build on that or appropriate it. So the Lord said to Moses, gather from me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of the meeting and have them take their place there with you. I will come down and talk with you there and I will take some of the spirit, this, say some of the spirit, that this, this is on you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people along with you so that you will not bear it all by yourselves. 26. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but had not gone out to the tent, so that they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medab are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of the chosen men, said, My Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all, would that all the peoples were prophets and that God, the Lord would put his spirit on them? And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. So let's go ahead and jump to Luke here. Okay. <clears throat> Luke 10, 1 and 2. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the, harvest, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go. I'm sending you out like lambs among the wolves. So, uh, and it's interesting there that it, that uh, your Bible says 72 because we have manuscripts that say 70 and we have manuscripts that say 72. Yes. And so uh, the folks who put your translation together went with the one that said 72. They were more convinced that that was, was authentic. In the NRSV, they went with 70, and then they put a footnote by 70 saying other ancient authorities read 72. Off the top of my head, I don't remember what the significance of 72 is. There is a reason why it's a significant number. But for our purposes, 
why might why might 70 people be significant here? What story might Jesus have in the back of his mind? Numbers. Right. Numbers is also a sacred number, right? I don't know if anybody is counting 70, but it's a round sacred number. Right. So yeah, there could be significance to the the number 70 just in terms of it kind of being a, a multiple of seven, you know, which kind of symbolizes completeness because we have seven days of creation. So uh, Jesus kind of picks up on this. Moses has 70 elders who share the work. Jesus now appoints 70 people who are going to share the work of spreading the news of the kingdom. So we have that parallel um, with Jesus and Moses and 70 people being empowered to join in that work of God's, God's appointed leader. Well, 72 is divisible by 12. Did they, did he send them out by 12s, like the 12 disciples or were they uh, separated into smaller groups than that? He sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town in and pairs. place. Okay. Right. So divisible by 12 probably doesn't matter. Huh? Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, there is some, someone somewhere along the way has found a significance to 72. Um, I want to say it had something to do with in some other part of the Old Testament, they listed 72 different ethnicities or something like that. So it's symbolic that Jesus is sending it to every nation or something like that. Um, I don't have any of my commentaries on Luke in front of me right now, but I, I think it had something to do with that. I would say I'm probably more convinced that the 70 makes sense just because there is that direct parallel to what Moses is doing. Um, interestingly enough, that um, second part that we read out of Numbers, we see a parallel to that in Acts as well. Uh, Renee, can you also share with us uh, from just a couple verses up, Luke 9, 49 and 50? And we tried to stop him because not one Hold on, I can't hear you. Myself again. There we go. Now I hear you. Oop. Oh wait, now you are muted. Uh oh. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, was, third time's a charm. Okay, we'll try it one more time. Master said, John, we saw, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. So somebody approaches the leader and said, hey, Someone who's not one of your hand-picked people is doing the same stuff as your hand-picked people. And the leader says, why should that be a problem? They're doing what I need people to do. Um, so, you know, again, we get the same thing happening to Jesus as, as happened to Moses. And then, Tom, can you share with us then uh, uh, those verses out of the book of Acts? When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And 16, if you can, yeah. 16 through 17. Uh, no, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, 
and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And so what, what is Moses wish again here when they come and say, hey, there's some people who aren't part of your 70 who are prophesying. What is Moses' response to that situation? Well, isn't it the more people that are prophesying, the more people that can be reached? Well, Moses just says, you know, Let if go, only, right? yeah, if only all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would who put his spirit on them. And then what happens in the book of Acts? They all became prophesiers. Yeah, the spirit was poured out on all of them and all of them spoke uh, spoke a word about God. Um, so I know we always go to the book of uh, the prophet Joel when we're talking about Pentecost, but I think this is a this is a fascinating part of that that lineage as well. Moses, this this greatest person in in the witness of the Hebrew Bible, if only all of God's people could have this spirit of God that empowered them to speak. And then here, book of Acts, that spirit of God, that Holy Spirit is poured out and it's poured out on everybody. And all of these people who are gathered there begin to be able to speak a word about God so that other people can all hear it. So I, I think there is an important part where this story out of the book of Numbers shapes that account of Pentecost. So I think we see it in the ministry of Jesus. We also see it in the ministry of the church. So uh, Numbers does show up there. It is not as popular in the New Testament as Psalms or Isaiah or Deuteronomy, but uh, it does show up in some interesting places. Jane, would you share with us, please, Numbers 14, 33 and 34, and Nick, would you share with us, please, Luke 4, 1 through 13? I got to find it. Um, 33 and 34, 14, 33 and 34. Okay. And your children, and your ch children shall be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of the dead bodies lay in the wilderness, according to the number of the days in which you spied out of the land 40 days for every day a year. You shall be, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. Did I read the right thing? Well, Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people. Nick, I think you're in. I think you're in Acts. We oh. wanna. We wanna hear out of Luke. Sorry. That's all right. I mean, a Acts is great content too, but uh, uh, Luke. Luke is really where I'm. I'm thinking we'll see a parallel here. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those, 40, during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are son of God, command this stone to become loaf of bread. Jesus answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant 
all the kingdom of the world. And the devil said to him, to you, I will give you their glory and all this authority for it has been written over to me. It has been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus said to him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple saying to him, if you are if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hand, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it said, do not put your Lord, your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an op opportune time. So what are the parallels we are seeing here between Numbers 14 and Luke 4? How are we seeing that maybe Numbers influenced what was going on uh, in the New Testament? Uh, I mean, both had both had to do with 40, obviously, um, in terms of in, the, in numbers, the number of additional years that they were going to have to remain outside the promised land. And for, and for um, Jesus, it was 40 days in the desert to, uh, where he was tempted. But, you know, that's kind of, to me where the parallel ends, because in numbers case, the um the people were totally unfaithful and um um and revolted against god and whereas jesus did just the opposite right so in in a sense it is influenced by by numbers but it, it develops in a different direction i think the parallel goes a little bit deeper though because we remember they are going to wander for 40 years because is, is it is because it is this generation that came out of Egypt who need to be kind of culled from the people. They, the, the people needs to be purified of these folks who saw all these great things that God did and then turned around and worshiped other gods. So they had to wander until they were kind of properly prepared for their calling to be the people living in the promised land. So some of that had to do with the Exodus generation dying off, and some of it had to do with continuing to receive this teaching from God that would prepare them for living in the promised land. Why is Jesus brought out and tempted, or I think a more faithful translation is tested in the wilderness? Why, why do we do that to Jesus? I guess he, to be tested to uh, fulfill his role as the Messiah. Yeah, is he is he really up to the task? Being the Messiah is a a big task. You do not want to throw someone out there who is not ready for it. So I I think the parallel, and I one hundred percent agree. There is definitely a noticeable point of divergence between. This Exodus generation really struggling with staying faithful to God and Jesus under bad circumstances remaining faithful to God. So, yeah, that, that those I think are definitely set up to be in contrast to one another. But I think that parallel of there is this period of preparation for what is to come next. I think that is true of the numbers account. It is also true of Jesus. I think you could even go so far, and if you don't agree with me on this, that that's on you. But I think you could even go so far as to say, what did the Israelites really complain about a lot? Ugh, manna again. We are just tired of this food. We're going to complain about what God has sent us to eat. And then we get that, that kind of 
darkly humorous thing where God says, you want meat? And it actually says, you're going to have meat coming out of your noses. I'm going to bury you in quails. Um, so the people of Israel, they just stick it to God about the food. Jesus is out there and the Satan says, here, you're hungry. Turn the stone into bread. And Jesus says, no. One does not live by bread, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So something to do with food. The people in the wilderness did not do an exemplary job. Jesus does. The people worship another god. We read just last week in chapter 25, they worship the Baal of Peor. Jesus is enticed. Worship me and I'll give you all all this great stuff. Jesus does not worship another God. The third temptation there, throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple. I'm not sure if there is a parallel to that in the story of the Exodus. Um, but I think the first two, I, I would I would say, yeah, there's definitely parallels in, in Exodus there. Um, Something else I'll just throw out there uh, if people want to meditate or stew on this a little bit. Uh, commentators disagree on whether the devil, the devil says, I will give you all their glory and all this authority that has been given over to me. Uh, commentators disagree. Is that actually true? Does somehow the devil have all this power? You know, the only way he could have it, he says, you know, it has been given to me. That's the only way you can have that kind of power because he's nowhere near as powerful as God. Or is this like one of those, well, something you see on uh, one of the, the crime shows that I'd love to watch. The officer walks in and says, we have your DNA all over the crime scene. The person goes, ah, I did it. I did it. And the other cop is standing behind the mirror and goes, we didn't find any DNA. You know, is this a bluff? Uh, and then Jesus worships him and then he goes, ha. Gotcha! You don't get anything. Just something to think about. Just something to think about. But, like I said, we have that in contrast. Jesus says, worship the Lord your God, serve only him. Whereas some of these people uh, among the Israelites in the wilderness, they say, other gods? Great! Where can I worship them? So, we have a, a point of departure there as well. So I think the the numbers narrative, I, I think, definitely influences the the testing of Jesus in the wilderness. The third temptation you might be able to say has to do with land and taking ownership of the land. Going, the, the people weren't allowed to go into their promised land and hear Jesus, and they wanted it dearly, right? That's what they had traveled so far for. And Jesus was told by Satan that he could take over all that land. And he said, no. Could hmm. that be a, is that a stretch or is that? You know, I, I almost see that, uh, you know, throw yourself off the temple. I, I, maybe there's a parallel between that and when the people went to spy out the promised land because it's almost like, God God had said, you can go and take it, but the people said, no, we can't. So there's this disconnect between what the people think is possible and what God tells them is possible. And I'm just I'm just thinking out loud there, but yeah. You know what? I got mixed up or, too because the but, third temptation is the throw yourself off the temple not the look at this land i'll give you mm -hmm. so. uh, in, in luke it is when matthew tells uh the temptation of jesus he switches those two so okay. if that that may be a, a piece of the confusion but uh okay. you know we we can always go back to the drawing board on this we'll we'll be back to <laughs> luke's gospel eventually but uh Suffice it to say, I believe numbers definitely influences the account of Jesus being tested in the wilderness. Uh, does does that preach? Will, will people will people buy that? Sure. Okay. Carol says yes. I'll take it. Okay. Um, 
who gets to read next? Uh, who just who just read the temptation of Jesus there? I did. Nick did. Okay, so we'll go back to the top of my list here. Uh, I will share with you Numbers 21, 1 through 9. Carol, will you share with us, please, John 3, 14 through 16. Numbers 21. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negeb, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. Then Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed give this people into our hands, then we will utterly destroy their towns. The Lord listened to the voice of Israel and handed over the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their towns, so the place was called Hormah. From Mount Hor, they set out to go by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever the serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Okay, John. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. So here as we get to one of those key verses in scriptures, we see we see a a connection here. What is the obviously John refers directly to the story. What would we say is kind of the the parallel beyond just saying he says, yeah, it's like this, but what does he mean when he says it's like this? Just as the serpent was lifted up and when people looked up to it, um, it healed them. So Jesus was also lifted up onto the cross. And when people looked upon Jesus, they could be healed of their sins. Mm -hmm. So, and it's interesting in that it's this idea of they look at the serpent and are healed from the serpent. They look at the crucified savior and they are healed from death. So this idea of kind of taking what is harmful and God being able to transform that into something good and life-giving, uh, I think is definitely the the parallel there. And I think it's important that is uh, John 3.16, the, the world's favorite Bible verse. Um, you know, it, it grows directly out of Jesus talking about what's going on here in the book of Numbers. And then uh, this last one here, uh, this, this brief parallel that I want to lift up before we close with just some more general discussion. Uh, Renee, will you share with us, please, number numbers 27, 17? And Tom, will you share with us, please, Mark 6, 34? And Renee will ask you to unmute there. Twenty-seven, seventeen. Yes. You go out. So yeah, we do not want the people to be like sheep without a shepherd. And what do we find in Mark? <clears throat> As he went ashore. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, 
because they were like sheep without a shepherd and began to teach them many things. So Moses does not want his people to be like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus sees people who are like sheep without a shepherd and he he begins to shepherd them. He begins to to let them know this is who God is and what God is about. Uh, so we see it's not as, uh, maybe not as in-depth of a parallel as what we saw in some of the others, but certainly worth worth mentioning there. Um, any questions on that New Testament reception uh, part of our discussion? I like that. Thank you. Because, you know, so, so many people think that the Old Testament is no longer, um, some people think that it's no longer necessary to be, to understand the Old Testament because Jesus came in the New Testament, but there are so many parallels and we have to remember that that's all Jesus had was the Old Testament to preach from. Yeah, so when, when Jesus, yeah, when Jesus talks about scripture, he means the Old Testament, like he does not mean the books that were written about him after he died, resurrected, and ascended. And um, Jesus really doesn't make sense without the Old Testament. Um, without those promises he came to fulfill, it's really hard to understand who he is and what he's about. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely want to be well-grounded in our, in our Old Testament, absolutely. Do you think Jesus had access to all the books of the Old Testament or just the Pentateuch and Psalms or something like that? My guess is he probably had access to, to the whole of, of Hebrew scriptures. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the, the canon of Hebrew scripture was fairly well set by this time. There was not uh, to the to my knowledge there was not a ton of argument over which books belonged and which books didn't um he's certainly very well versed in in hebrew scripture and um i mean we know for an absolute fact he had access to isaiah because in luke he pulls out the scroll of isaiah and he reads from the prophet and he he preaches on it but yeah, my, my sense is he had access to the law, the writings, and the prophets. So let me just throw things open just for some more uh, general discussion in the last couple minutes here. As we have worked on the, the book of Numbers here, what would you say rose to the top for you in terms of what is God's word of good news? What is the word of blessing? What is the, the gospel in, in this book for you? That God will continue to, or does continue to bless the Israelites, even though they goof up so many times. At the end, they ended up not going to um, the, the ones that went through the wilderness didn't end up going to the promised land, but they had multiple blessings, even though they really screwed up. And, and their children did go into the promised land. And that is certainly a a blessing as well but yeah there, there's a lot of grace um in in spite of god's anger in spite of the extent to which people provoked god there's a lot of grace god just does not give up on these people Anyone else find any any gospel or good news in this in this book?
what caught your imagination? What uh, what really intrigued you? What made you go, huh, or or surprised you? I would I would say the um, the the ability of, the, of God to get angry and punish in a way that, um, quite frankly, we're not used to seeing from a strictly um, New Testament point of view and, and you know, it isn't really taught very much um, today, you know, with our kids and, and even, even less so today, I would maintain than, than when we, meaning myself and most of my compadres in, on the, um, in, in this uh, study group, um, you know, cause we, I can still remember as a first grader um, or second grader somewhere in there having a coloring book where uh, you would color the flames of hell with people in it. And, you know, I always, I always use my, my red orange crayon for that. I always thought that was a good color for, for hell. And, but, and, you know, but my point is that I doubt if that coloring coloring book is used much today in Sunday school. <laughs> be my, my guess. Um, so, so that, that's what caught my imagination. Mm. I mean, you know, as we said before, um, Moses didn't get to go to the promised land because he didn't give God credit for um, for the uh, water coming out of the rock. Yeah, and it's interesting that you should point that out. Someone said this morning that since we've been studying numbers, the person said, I just don't get how God could get so angry at people for complaining. But then it's gotten me thinking about, you know, when I complain about something or I complain about someone, maybe maybe I need to stop and think about it first. And I said, if you are at a point where you decide, hey, I got to stop and think about it, then the book of Numbers is doing its job. Because remember, a lot of it is about teaching, is about forming God's people. So if reading the book of Numbers has spurred somebody to say, you know what, I'm going to stop and think about this. I'm going to do something a little differently in light of what I have seen here. It's doing its job. Because remember, we do preach law and gospel. There is there is judgment and grace. And, and boy, howdy, do we see some judgment here in Numbers. We also see a lot of grace and forgiveness. But the... Examples of judgment are uh, uh, quite intense, uh, usually more intense than we think about. Um, but you know, we've we've all read Matthew's gospel. Jesus gets pretty judgmental in Matthew's gospel. Mm -hmm. Jesus has had enough. He he lets people know. So yeah, it's it's usually not the go to go to type of content, but it's. It's there, and now we have, you know, kind of looked at it a little more thoroughly than, than usually we do. Well, we can see that God's punishment is severe, and, and it kind of makes me think of people that don't think hell exists or that, you know, there's no one, no one that at the end of days that God won't punish anyone because he's a loving God. Well, guess what? He has punished, uh -huh. and his punishment can be severe. And but it's going to be, but it's fair. That's the thing that we'll hold on to. We'll know that it's fair and just. Yeah, and there's there's a kind of a sense of of immediacy in God's corrective action to try and put a euphemism on it there's an immediacy to it that i think we're also not accustomed to um so that, that i think is also very different from what we typically encounter or see anyone else have something that kind of got their attention or caught their imagination <laughs> So
So what in the book of Numbers built up your faith? What in reading this book strengthened your faith, built you up, kind of deepened that relationship with, with God? I think the fact that uh, we can see time and time again that uh, humans mess up, but God still loves us, forgives us, and and we move, and He moves on, and so should we, I guess. God leads them to that next stage in the journey, mm-hmm. and they they may be limping by the time they get to that next stage, but God still leads them on. So the way Jacob limped the rest of his life, the way that the the risen Christ said, look at my hands. You know, Jesus was risen. He was, he was resurrected, but he still bore those scars. So the people, they received that, that discipline, but then God said, we're, we're going to move on. Hopefully you have learned something along the way about how to live faithfully. But yeah, they, God, God keeps leading them down the path. He keeps keeps bringing them forward. Yes. What did people find challenging about this book? I, I know we have definitely talked about, we see a... Uh, a, a God who leans a little more towards law and judgment, uh, that that has been challenging. Are, are there things in addition to that, both that, you know, either you found challenging to your your faith or things that were just challenging in the sense of, I'm having a hard time making sense of this? Well, the command that he gives to people, Moses and later on to Joshua, to kill all the people in the land and occupy the land, that seems so unfair because all those creator people are also created to God. God loves all people. So how can he kill somebody and their wives and the children and the cattle? and occupy the land. It seems so unfair. Yeah, that is... Um, if, if that is challenging to you now, once we get into a little bit into Deuteronomy and definitely when we get into the book of Joshua, uh, that is going to be really challenging. Um, and I think a part of that has to do with it may be looking back looking back from the point of view of the people in exile. They realized they had not followed that commandment from God, and there they were sitting in exile. So I think that that might have something to do with the reason why that's kind of lifted up and prominent. But yeah, it's it's really troubling. These, these people were living there and seemingly, seemingly through no fault of their own, God said, well, this is actually for somebody else. So, um, you got to go. That's, and, and in many respects, there are similar things going on in the exact same spot today. Um, and, and there are not really easy solutions to that either. So yeah, that, that is definitely challenging. Anything else folks wanna throw out there as we uh, come to a come to the end of uh, our study of numbers and the end of our, our time together for the calendar year? Well, let me say thank you to everybody for being here tonight. Thank you for being here so faithfully uh, all through the fall and the beginning of winter here. Um, Look forward to gathering with you again in January and continuing. And, um, you know, just uh, 
thank you for letting me kind of lead you on this walk through numbers. It was not a book that I knew a heck of a lot about. So um, I'm glad that you were willing to walk with me through this uh, unknown territory here. Um, thank you for all your efforts, Pastor. It, yes. was, it was nice. It was great. Yes, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thanks, for, very... doing, thanks for doing numbers. That, that was a, a big help to a lot of people. And Merry Fantastic. Christmas to everyone. Yes, Merry blessings Christmas. on the remainder of Advent and Christmas and all the wonderful things that go with that. And uh, why don't we close our time together by praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good night, everyone. Good, Good night. night. Blessings you. on your Wednesday. We'll see everybody soon. Merry Thank Christmas to all. Merry Thank Christmas. You, Take care. Merry Christmas.